Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. In, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're sitting here in my office at Utah Valley University, along with Dr. Angela Schill, who will be co-hosting with me today. Thomas is a world traveler and has been on the road for quite a while and is joining us with his wife, who is not going to join the conversation, but is is going to listen and uh, maybe correct her husband from time to time, uh, <laughs> depending on how it goes. Uh, real pleasure to be with you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about empowering marginalized communities uh, through social entrepreneurship endeavors, and uh, you're a great person to have this conversation with. As we get started, I wanted to share Thomas's bio with everybody. Thomas Ng is founder of Genastum, a for-profit social enterprise that aims to empower marginalized communities through specialization in e-learning, digitalization, and ESG services. His remarkable journey began in 2008 when he embarked on a mission to provide meaningful employment opportunities for the disadvantaged. Through Genastum, he has empowered individuals across 25 countries from people with disabilities to refugees and older adults by pioneering a 100% remote work environment. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of Thomas's background. We're gonna explore more of his background today. Um, Thomas, before we dive on into the conversation, anything you would like to share or highlight um, and then we'll just... No, I think as we go along, go perhaps I would do some flashbacks, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And again, thank you, Angela, for joining me. Always a pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you, John. Maybe the first question, if you could tell us a little bit about Janashtam and a little bit of the origin story of how you moved from more of the corporate mm -hmm. executive lifestyle and career towards um, getting out of that rat race and moving into the social entrepreneurship realm. Okay, so, so I had a pretty good uh, corporate career for 25 years. And uh, the last 15 years of that, I was, uh, in those days, it was quite a big thing to be an expatriate in Asia. So I was one of the very first Asian expatriates. You know? And of course, as an expatriate, in those days, you do lead a rather decadent lifestyle, you know, belong to the clubs and all this kind of stuff. And, um, but after 15 years, I, found that um, corporate life was a, so not was not for me um, just felt that uh, couldn't find a real sense of purpose and um, didn't really like some of the things I was asked to do <laughs> so uh, I actually had no intention of going into social entrepreneurship for me it was just that I was spending so much time at work and traveling so much I didn't spend enough time with family so I thought I would just maybe take a few years off and spend some time at home family had moved to Melbourne, the kids were studying in school there. And I was in Manila working. I mean, it's a kind of a it doesn't really make sense. So, but uh, in big companies, so senior executives, there's such a thing as the garden leave clause in your contract. So when I resigned, they activated that garden leave, which I didn't even know was there. Uh, that clause and uh, basically they paid me for a year I had to stay put and just in case they needed me for something but mostly it was to stop me from working for yeah. other competitors or uh, other companies I tried to get out of it I said I signed any document you know to say that I would not work at all just I was even to say I just me. not work with anybody but they wouldn't agree so I ended up still spending quite, quite a bit of time in, in Manila they paid for my house my car my driver the whole works I could travel in and out, but um, so during the time when I was a uh, working executive there, I get a lot of invitations to join NGO boards and I always say I had no time and actually do, I didn't have any time, but uh, so th that year I had no excuse. So I was quite intrigued because some of my fellow CEO friends had um, sitting on the board of this uh, computer school for the blind and I thought, hmm, 
blind people use the computer, never come across. So I attended the first board meeting at uh, the time before, you know, I confirmed the appointment. Uh, so they did a bit of selling job and it was this blind guy giving a PowerPoint presentation, which had music incorporated in the PowerPoint presentation. And I said, this is very good. They said, so who did this for you? And they said, no, I did it myself. And I said, hang on just a minute. I don't believe you, you know, so. He challenged me to um, look for something on the internet. Uh, we had a third person say, okay, look for this. And, then, you know, we put, and he, he did three tries and he beat me every time. So kind of convinced me that, hey, these two people can actually do yeah. this. So I said to the board, I asked the board, I said, so how many people have you trained and how many are working where? You know? So at that time, 2007 it was, no, actually 2000 and five it was actually uh, they had trained 500 blind people to use the computer over five years but none of them were actually in any meaningful gainful employment so most of them just went back to the provinces and just went about life the same as before except they could now go onto facebook so that was a big achievement <laughs> so i made it my role i said hang on these people should be working you know and so i said i'm going to make my 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 board position the one for employment so I took these uh, graduates to to various companies uh, who the CEOs are my good friends. And of course, they always be as impressed as I was, calling all the uh, vice presidents and say we have to do something for these people. And, but it's always, oh, we have strategic planning exercise coming up. Let's do this in two months time. Then it was budget and it was this yeah. and it was that and it was uh, some crisis and it was always and then oh, our HR person just left and wish for a new one to come in and the new one came in, give him a, two months to get, <laughs> get into the job. So it was, yeah. so after two and a half years, how many people have managed to place in the employment? Zero. So I, at that point I said, okay, I'm not going to spend any more time doing this. So I said, but I was totally convinced as I got to know them better, I said, they can actually work. And then, of course, when you look, I was at that time only trying to promote it for the blind, but then I got to know also the other people, other disabilities and all that. So I said, okay, we're going to start a company. So it was a classic thing that like you start a company without knowing what you're going to do, you know. Oh, you know, I said, I'm going to employ these people, <laughs> they can work. So what are we going to do? We, we, we came to the realization is that hiring a person with disability in Manila, you know, normal people take two to three hours to commute to work each way. So for a person with disability, it was just impossible. He might, he might have to start coming the day before, you know, to arrive at the office yeah. in the morning. And probably he'll be, you know, rock blind I mean, by the time he got yeah. to, to the office. So then it's okay, we have to have a 100% remote work model. You know, so we said, okay, fine. And it was tough because in those days, the internet wasn't what it is today, especially in the Philippines. So right. a little bit of a struggle, we kind of, but we somehow kind of managed it. And then the next step was, so, okay, we know that we're going to hire people with uh, from the marginalized communities and they can work online. And what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, so, the okay, then said, well, well, you can do uh, programming, uh, web development, you can do this, you can do that. And we stumbled into e-learning. thought, oh, this is a very interesting thing. Way too early, I mean, seven, eight years, probably too early, but never mind. We represented a company who was selling an online MBA program. And so we did our own English training online. Yeah. And uh, it was just very tough because the market just wasn't there. So we kind of, uh, you know, uh, struggled for, I would say more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there because, you know, you might, yeah, you know, that's how I actually got into the game. <laughs> no, that, yeah. that's wonderful. And if we can go back just a little bit. So mm -hmm. you mentioned in the corporate world, you're in these executive roles, mm -hmm. you're living a posh lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, being an expat mm -hmm. in these different countries. Um, and you, you make the decision that this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not spending enough time with your family. Mm -hmm. You want to, you're not feeling meaning purpose. You're being asked to do things mm -hmm. that maybe you don't agree with that you're uncomfortable yeah. with. Yeah. I think anyone listening who finds themselves in a big organization can probably relate yeah. to all of those sentiments. Mm -hmm. And it's always this tension, I think, that we all feel. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even even here at UVU, we're 45,000 students. I don't know how many thousands of employees. It's a big organization. Mm -hmm. And I love this place. Mm -hmm. and I love the faculty I work with. I love the students. I love the programs I've been I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. But any organization, 
you're going to have things that frustrate you. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're even going to have the, the higher you go up into the leadership within an organization. Oftentimes, the more often you're asked to even compromise a little bit of your ethics or your integrity, your exactly. personal integrity. Yeah. Um, and that's hard mm -hmm. uh, to be able to navigate that. Um, can you, can you zoom in and speak to that a little bit more about like what that tension you were feeling, what you were experiencing at the time and why you took the drastic step to resign, you know, 25 years of, of great experience. Mm -hmm. You're clearly a needed valued administrator and executive. Um, you have lots of success. It must've been pretty dramatic mm -hmm. at that point in time to the extent you're comfortable sharing. Like what was going on at that point to, to push you towards, I, I'm going to be done for a while. I'm going to step yeah. aside. So of course there are many things. Um, let me see. I try to be diplomatic here. I mean, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll just touch on two. One is that uh, people, I mean, you, you become a leader in an organization, you, you get to know your people and you tell them certain things and you, you know, say, this is how, you know, we, this is how a relationship is going to be and all that. But then in the corporate world, you, you, you don't have control on execution. So next year, they may come up with a new plan and say, this is the way we, <laughs> we, we run our this HR program. And then you know, suddenly you tell people, well, you, actually, you don't know what to tell them anymore. You know? So that was very, very difficult. And, and then every year, we'd have the top management. This was a European company. So they go off into a deer hunting country or something like that. And then, <laughs> You know, stay in a, a lot somewhere, and yeah. in the evening they'll be drinking their vodka and they're talking about the organization. So they come back, you know, in September, and then we have a new organization restructuring oh. implemented every year. Oh boy! And then we <laughs> print new name cards, reorganize people in different boxes, <laughs> move tables around in the office, and everything. And for me, is that they haven't changed the business. And then you go to clients. The worst thing is go to clients is like. How do I describe it? It's like we're selling these tumblers, right? So we tell a client, oh, you know, actually, you know, blue tumblers, they are really very, very good. So we are making them all blue because the blue has this effect of calming and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And then next year, you go to the same customer, you make a red tumbler, and it's like, <laughs> actually, research shows that the red color actually, you know, you know, increases your energy and this yeah. and that and everything. And then the next year will be a yellow tumbler and try to tell another story. And I couldn't face people telling them nonsense. Mm. I'm, the, I'm the local and the country manager of a big multinational company. And how can I go and tell my customers? And my customers become my friends. Yeah. And then some of them remain my friends, you know, until today, you know, I've left the corporate world for decades. So I couldn't, yeah. couldn't deal with that. I find it very difficult to deal with. And so, and then what do you do every day? You're doing stuff for somebody in head office and you know for a fact that what you're doing has no impact on the business, has no impact on the people, has no impact on your customer. You're doing it because somebody... Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was how I said I just couldn't do this anymore. I just didn't feel good about, about myself. Uh. No, I mean, that makes complete sense to me. Um, and Angela, feel free to chime in. But mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I don't know. One of the reasons why I became a professor is because I just felt like I had to do something where I derived meaning and purpose mm -hmm. and where I, I could see the impact of what I was doing, or at least trying to do. Um, and, you know, I going way back in time, I, I was an accounting major in university mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with accountants. We need good accountants, but, and I was good at it and I was like, oh, this is a good program, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But ultimately. I just came to this realization, thankfully early, mm. that that wasn't going to bring me meaning and purpose. Mm. It, I wasn't going to be satisfied in that kind of career. It would have, I would have done well. It would mm. have been secure. I would have, you know, lots of job security. I would have had, um, you know, made a good living, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, and all of that's fine and well, and, and I, nothing against people who choose accounting. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't for me. Like, mm. It just wasn't the right fit for me. Mm. And, and I, like you say, I could not find myself in a situation where I, I feel like on a daily basis, I have to check my own kind of outsource my own morality and, and check it at the door, <laughs> you know, to, to, to say, you know, people say it all the time. Well, yeah. I didn't have a choice. So-and-so told me to, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not a good answer yeah. in my opinion. You know, like if you don't think it's right, mm. then you either don't do it or 
you have the hard conversation with the person telling you to do the thing mm-hmm. and try to convince them and try to influence them, right? And there's only so much of that you can do before you feel like you're beating your head against a brick wall mm-hmm. and you feel like you have to do something different. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm hearing you yeah. say a little bit. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I resonate with that. Angela, anything you wanted to? Yeah. I, I know a little bit of this story and I would like to hear, I'd like our audience to hear what that conversation was like with your wife, Jen, when you came to her and said, I'm doing this pivot and how she, how she took okay, that, that was, what happened. That was easy because it, it happened in stages. So it kind of snuck uh-huh. up on her, right? Uh-huh. So the first <laughs> thing was, honey, I'm going to spend all my time home with you and the kids. That was the first yeah. thing, right? Yeah. I said, I quit my job, right? Yeah. <laughs> By that time, I didn't even know myself that I had to hang around for another year. Mm-hmm. So they kind of said, well, I can't get out of it. It's a legal thing. Otherwise, they'll sue me. So I yeah. ended up spending <laughs> a year. And then, of course, you know, then uh, it kind of crept up on her. I, I don't think there was a point where I presented everything to her in it one go. <laughs> it was a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I, I but I remind, I remember this very profound moment when, you know, I worked so much and you know, I made a lot of money, and mm-hmm. basically, I'm not the investor type person, and mm-hmm. and I basically had my most of my salary was paid to a bank account in Switzerland. And uh, I, I did nothing with it. It was just left. Mm-hmm. And so when I re- when I left corporate life, so of course, my friends recommend, you know, fund managers and all that kind of stuff. They you my money sitting there, not doing anything and everything. So I, yeah. so I did, did that just before the GFC. Mm. So I was unlucky enough to be introduced to a, a rope trader of sorts. And um, he kind of, you know, um, lost all my money. Well, anyway, most of it. And then I ended up with, you know, what we had left. And I sat down with her. I said, look, you know, this is no nest for anything. Um, so I said, but I had this idea because there was after I attended the NG, the computer school. Right? Yeah. Let's do this. I said, we're living in Australia. It's a very comfortable environment. We mm-hmm. have a house. We don't owe anybody any money. Mm-hmm. I said, what comes to us, we'll lose it all. You know, we'll just go and work in the checkout counter of a supermarket <laughs> and we'll live comfortably for the rest of our lives, you know. And I said, I promise I won't touch the house, you know. And that was a profound moment because then she said to look around, she said to me, we can move to a smaller house. <laughs> so the support was kind of, uh, and I tell my employees all the time, I say, look, that without the support, can you imagine any wife allowing a husband to do something so insane? <laughs> Right, it the rest of the money special. we just throw it away, <laughs> and uh, a bunch of people who, who have no qualification, never worked before, and you yeah. don't know most of them. And uh, that's, that's yeah. an incredible amount of support, yeah, and faith yeah. in your vision. And then for 10 years, from an expat wife, you know how an expat wife lives, it's different I mean, you know, lifestyle. become a wife of a so- struggling social entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a total change. Of oh, life. yeah, oh, yeah. But I think it was it was very useful and it was good because now we suddenly now don't have that financial constraint anymore and we just feel that um, we don't need a lot of things that we used to have. We actually found out we don't need anymore. Yeah, interesting. So so it's quite easy for us to be happy and you know we you know basically we don't take out much money from the company or the company is doing very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the employees get paid off several times more than we do <laughs> you know so wow. so uh, uh but for us it's we're very comfortable i mean we can fly here you know we can, yeah but you, know. you didn't know how it would be at that no point in fact in uh, yeah that yeah big question mark yeah but we just felt that uh, at that time we just felt that look i still am able to do this i, I believe i mean that was 15, 15 years ago i'm young enough and uh i think there is a potential here yeah. um and uh yeah but to be honest if somebody had told me at that time it would take you 12 years before you start seeing anything, probably wouldn't have started. <laughs> yeah. 12 years is a long time, yeah. And it, it doesn't quite reach the level of support that your wife exhibited. Yeah. But I just think back to like when I went, you know, it's a series of stages of going to my wife yeah. and saying, first, I want to change my major. First, I want, you know, I want oh, yeah. to do this grad program. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I'm sure she got really tired of, <laughs> of these conversations, you know, right and, and the last, the last time we had that conversation, um, I was graduating with my master's degree mm-hmm. and we were ready to not be poor anymore, um, <laughs> ready to like go get a nice corporate job. And, 
you know, make money and blah, blah, blah. And we already had a kid. We had a second on the way. Um, and I remember going, I was like in a third round interview uh, with Honeywell. And oh. great, great company. Oh, yes. It would have been a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I, I left that interview were just with the realization, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, uh, on, I walked home that night mm -hmm. and on the way home, uh, I'm thinking, you know what, I, I think I want to do a PhD and mm -hmm. it had always been in the back of my mind, maybe someday, but mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I think I just want to do this now. And I got home and I kind of dropped the bombshell on my wife cause she was ready to be done with student mm -hmm. housing <laughs> and like all that. Oh, yes. And, and not only did I want to do a PhD, but I, I wanted to do sociology. Mm. Um, so not like business or something like mm. I, I was going to do, like, I, I could be, I could be putting us in a state where we we're going to be poor our whole lives. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was so supportive the whole wow. time. And, you know, she supported me through that program, you know, six kids. She then did her own degree. She's mm. now a professor here as well. Um, mm. but she did it in the non-traditional path. Um, anyways, like just i just wanted to reiterate how yeah. helpful it is how important it is to have great support from those you love yes absolutely otherwise how could you you couldn't do it i mean yeah. you can't go yeah. home and then you know the wife whining at you why the hell do you do yeah. this you know and <laughs> why can't i afford this anymore <laughs> because well, you decided you want to do this yeah but you know john in your case i mean you're, you're quite lucky to have found a good because a good university to work for. Because yeah. I know many, uh, not many, I know a few professors, uh, good friends who really complain about it. It's not, a, yeah, it's not, it's not an you easy know? thing to, you know? to land so, a good position. So, a good yeah, a, a, a good uh, uh, employer is uh, something quite, uh, quite rare, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, something else I wanted to hone in on, your focus in your company on working with disadvantaged populations, yeah. particularly those with disabilities. Mm. I, I um, years ago, this was a long, long time ago, but I served an LDS mission in South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I lived for two years in Seoul, Incheon, mm -hmm. that region of South Korea. Um, and, and then upon finishing those two years, I came back, I went to university a bit, and then I went back and I worked in the Pusan, southern portion of South mm -hmm. Korea um, for, for LG Electronics, big company. Um, and so I had, I had that experience in Korea. And since then I've been back to China many times and I've lived in Australia and visited New Zealand and, and lived in, in, uh, in Jakarta, you know, different places throughout Asia. Uh, and I know Angela has been all over too. Angela has been a world traveler also. Um, I'm curious from the disability standpoint, I know when I, my most intensive period was that two years mm -hmm. that I was a missionary mm -hmm. um, interacting with people in South Korea. And this was like nine, 1998 to 2000. So this is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. A lot may have changed since then. Mm -hmm. But I know the attitudes around disabled communities was not particularly positive. Yeah. Um, maybe to put it lightly. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, like, what kind of social stigma and barriers have you faced as you're trying to employ people from those marginalized communities, people who are disabled, mm. who people just assume they, they can't do this. They can't, yeah. you know, that that's breaking through that, mm -hmm. that mm. stigma and that attitude, yeah. I imagine could be very difficult. Could you speak to that a little bit? So uh, good question, because when we started the company in the first maybe 10 years or more, um, at least in the initial years, we were very, very careful in the sense that when we presented ourselves to a prospective client, we will never say that we are hiring people hmm. uh, who are disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. We just say, this is our company, this is not my employees, you already do this. Yeah. You know, uh, on our website, we have a tab from the very beginning called Beyond CSR. If anybody click on that tab, yeah. including photos, videos of employees, and you know, mm -hmm. they look, you know, they're, they're talking about their disability and yeah. everything, everything is disclosed. I can tell you throughout, say, at least 10 years mm -hmm. of talking to maybe 100, 200 client, uh, companies, not one single person click on that tab. <laughs> because if they click on that tab, they probably call me and say, Thomas, is this, is this true? You know? and, uh, and we did that because we were fearful that if we were to tell people that we, uh, the work we done by building, mm -hmm. they would not trust us. They would not think that we are a proper company or some kind of, another, some kind of NGO and we, have, we cannot expect 
quality right. service from you and all that. So we, we usually stayed away. In fact, I tell you, honestly speaking, until the, the, the first time that we got a project that that the client knew that we were using people with disabilities to do the project was actually with um, Microsoft Southeast Asia mm. when Astrid was the head for mm -hmm. the, oh, <laughs> and the uh, what you call, um, external and legal affairs. And that was the first time that actually somebody came to us and said, I want to give you this work because... Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. So it wasn't until I think I remember my, my corporate comp person came to me maybe three years ago and said, Thomas, isn't it about time that we, uh, you know, come out of the closet, yeah. <laughs> so to speak, you know, yeah. as far as uh, this is concerned. And when he first asked me, I said, oh, why, do you, look, why do you want to bother with this? Let's focus on business. It's growing, we're doing well and everything. Kept pestering. And so, yeah, in the last, I would say, two to three years, we started to be a bit more open. That's what we do and all that. Because I felt there wouldn't be any repercussions because you're yeah. solidly kind of, uh, you know. Your work would yeah, speak yeah, for itself. Yeah, that's right, exactly. But Have you faced repercussions? No. Or has it been a positive feedback or just neutral, would you say? Of course, it has been positive. I mean, people yeah. were just amazed. Uh, and we had clients that came to us and gave us more work, oh, actually. But, but this is in the most recent, I mean, in the more recent years, mm -hmm. you know. See, maybe, yeah. Two or three years. I mean, I remember Singapore Business Federation. Um, we were doing one program for them for training Singaporeans to become regional executives, and then they came to us and said, "Look, our foundation wants to run a CSR training for the companies, and they said we think your company is best suited." You know, they had they had proposals from three universities in Singapore. Wow. And they picked us instead. So it was kind of yeah. something else, right? They said, well, we feel that we want somebody who actually, you know, walks the yeah. talk. Yeah. They have bunch, sorry, but a bunch of academics talk about it. So, yeah, yeah. It's yeah sorry. It's <laughs> sorry. You know, so, so there was quite a feather in our cap. So, yeah, overall, it has been positive yeah. because we, we, we do a good job. We prove yeah. that we have done a good job. And even like, like B-Lab, for example, you know, when they... Mm -hmm. The, Bart Holohan himself was motivated to give us the opportunity to try because he was also they were also quite desperate. They didn't have resources to cope with the, yeah. the pipeline, you know. Uh, but he knew that you know that's uh, what we stand for and all that. So, but you know today we have one of our top analysts. He's a Malaysian guy, Raj. You know he Raj, right? Yeah. Paralyzed yeah. from the neck down, operates the computer by voice. And it's he's very fine companies in US, in Europe, and so it's, yeah. it's like way up there, you know. What I mean, so, so yeah, and and even then, you know, um, we had one of the senior people come out to Asia just in March, and uh, I so I invited him to dinner and brought some of them around. He's also the people with wheelchairs, crutches, blind people, you know. Yeah. And then he said that you know, Thomas, I've heard about this, but it's. It's not something that sticks in the mind until I come here and I see it and I say, this is real. So most people yeah. who hear about it just say, ah, it's something they do. They probably they... have a token guy there who does it. <laughs> and then, so, you know, but our company is run by a management team. Who are, there's only one person apart from me. I can't, I can't consider myself senior. So yeah. in the disadvantaged group, 67 years old, if I apply for a job, nobody will give me a job, right? Yeah. So apart from me, I mean... There's only one person who is not in any of those. We That's have categories. a bunch of disabled people, two are blind. We have a cancer survivor. We have, you know, my HR manager has serious depression problems. Mm. He's on is heavy that... medication. See, and, that, and I've clicked mm. on your tab, yeah. that tab that yeah. and it has all of the dis different testimonials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the internal newsletters that you've yeah, shared yeah, yeah. support each other. Mm. There's a culture that you've developed within mm. your... Mm. So I think when I think of your company, People, you you can stand by your work. People can yeah. see the quality of what you're producing, and yeah. the amount is the sheer amount is overwhelming. Yeah, and the different areas that you've been involved with, but also just seeing the supportive culture that you've created in it, mm. and not there's no bricks and mortar. Yeah, you're nothing. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What what was it? Any nowhere, yeah, everywhere, and nowhere, nowhere. Everywhere, nowhere. But the, <laughs> but you've supported yeah. each other so deeply, yeah. and I've learned a lot. You know, there was I read one of the articles about depression and how oh, yeah, yeah. working from home helped mm. them be able to cope with that. And I just think you've done a great job of supporting and creating a culture where there's support, and then you're reaching out and doing 
yeah. humanitarian work in addition to that, That's which right. to me is, it blows my mind. Actually, a remote work does help because I have uh, a few a number of instances people came to me and said, I was dealing with this, this guy, you know, for, for a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize he's blind. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't realize he's in a wheelchair mm -hmm. because I'm dealing with him online. Right. So I knew you meet the person in person, you wouldn't know. Right. So, yeah. so in a way, it removes that potential for bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's nice to be able to get past the biases that yeah. people have, right. the stigma that might be associated with it. And the bottom line is, if I'm a client and I'm trying to work with a company, mm -hmm. I don't, I shouldn't really care mm -hmm. who's yeah. doing the work or how they're doing the work as long as they do good work. Yeah. Right. And at the end of the day, you are doing great work, and that's why you're able to the clientele that you have and that you have return customers, et cetera. We get in our own way with our biases yeah. because we discount people that yeah. otherwise could be very capable just because in our minds, we can't conceive of how, mm -hmm. like I can't imagine how I could be productive if I say I didn't have arms. Mm. But we know that there are people that have incredibly successful careers and productive lives yeah, yeah. when yeah. they have that kind of a disability or talk about, we've been talking about physical disabilities largely, but like neurodivergent individuals, yeah. right? Like there's, there's so many different types of mm. um, disabilities that maybe I don't fully understand. I'm a neurotypical person, yeah, yeah. but they can unlock all sorts of different things that I couldn't do. Mm. Like they're, they could be great at things that I couldn't be great at perhaps, yeah. uh, or, or certainly they could be successful. And so just breaking down those, those mental barriers, yeah. I think that people have is really great. And even clients, that you have that didn't know they had mm -hmm. disabled individuals working yeah. on their projects, yeah. but later find out, yeah. I imagine, you know, they're, it, it's, it's heartwarming, yeah. you know, but people probably aren't going to hire you for the heartwarming story. <laughs> but once, once they hear it, they're like, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and then, the, you know, it, it can maintain a good relationship. Anyways, I think it's, it's really, really cool. Um, and I, you, you had told the story earlier of, you know, have, hiring individuals who are blind, mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, I, I think of one friend that I had all the way back into my college years and we were like good friends for, I don't know, at least six months mm. or more before I knew he was legally blind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was an honor student. Um, but you were with him physically. I'm, I'm physically in person with, with him. him and, you, you, even then, you know, and I did, he was so capable. Uh -huh. uh, he wasn't like 100% blind, but he was yeah. legally blind yeah, yeah, yeah. and he had all sorts of accommodations that maybe mm. I was oblivious, but okay. largely he just was super capable, super mm. smart, mm -hmm. super, super able to do anything he needed to do and he'd mm. figure out how to do it. And that's amazing. And, and, um, anyways, we, we just, we shouldn't sell people short, give people the opportunity to yeah. demonstrate what they can do. Absolutely. And that's one of the things your, your company's doing that yeah. I think is just so mm -hmm. tremendous. And I think it's great that sometimes people might have those biases you're talking about, John, then they meet you, they mm. meet people that work for you and know their stories mm. and it changes their, it, it diminishes those bias, mm. biases because suddenly they realize what yeah. what they thought was true is not true. Um, I love the story of, I think, is it Nadia that is your personal I secretary? Yeah, yeah. And then I find out later, you can tell the story about, is it Nadia that, um, how she operates, how she's able to do her yeah, work. Yeah, she, she um, is a cerebral palsy patient, mm -hmm. so she was, disabled from the neck down, uh, you know, from birth. Yeah. And she can move only the tip of her index finger on the right hand. She can't move the rest of that finger. She can move her hand. She can only move the tip. So her mother would, you know, wash in the morning, everything, put her in front of the, you know, wheelchair in front of her laptop, turn it on and put her hand onto the mouse. And the mouse is upside down because the tip of the finger moves the mouse and pulls the mouse to click with one of the knuckles. Yeah, that's incredible to me. <laughs> yes. And she runs my life. I mean, checks my flights, you know, yeah. make sure that the hotel booking is right and then my schedules and this and that. So Life community. She, she can do that. And she's, actually when she speaks, you won't notice because she has a very strong voice. Mm -hmm. Nadia speaks with a very strong voice and and she's been working, working with me for more than 10 years. See, and that taught me something. Mm -hmm. Working with you, working with Nadia, uh, arranging yeah. things. And then finding out about her story, it's, yeah. to me, I thought, oh, I had some biases I didn't even know about until now, yeah. and now they've been crushed because <laughs> I can see what this woman yeah. is doing, and it's yeah. it's inspiring. And 
for you to be the kind of supportive employer that sees this, that's willing for 12 years to just yeah. wait for the company to blossom and bloom and you didn't know COVID was coming or that yeah. I could be a good thing. That's right, yeah. But the thing is, that I just feel that there should be more, you know, you, you, you watch this CNN heroes, right? I mean, yeah. these people should be some kind of, you know, projected as some kind of inspiration, mm -hmm. but they don't, they don't do that. I mean, I, many of them, for example, we had the press interview some of us, you know, and, and when they published the article, it didn't really focus on the individual mm -hmm. and how that person with such a, you know, coming from such a disadvantaged background with so many limitations can thrive. I mean, and I don't know that I think somebody should start a series of, you know, showcasing I such, you know, uh, impressive. Uh, I still remember the first time I came to Denver, it was many years ago at the YPO conference. At that time, my, my dad was actually, Nadia was not even with me at that time. Yeah, it was uh, Maricel. She's blind, Filipina. Mm -hmm. And um, she had never traveled, you know, outside the Philippines. So in those days, it was not so simple. You know, um, when we come to the US, we need to get a different SIM card. You cannot right. carry right. your phone. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this was the CADMA network. We mm -hmm. are using the GSM network, everything. Mm -hmm. So in Ponting, I told her, Nadia, was like, when I come into the airport, you have to find the closest, fastest way for me to get her a SIM card so I, don't, so I can get back onto <laughs> online, think? right? And then so she comes in to me, sends me an email and said, you, you fly to Cathay Pacific, you land in Terminal 2, you come out and there's an escalator on the right. <laughs> wow. You take the escalator <laughs> up, then you go to door number three, you catch the bus to Terminal <laughs> 3. And when you come off, you take this escalator, you go up there on the second floor, make a sharp right turn, and there's this place called Joe something or other. And you can buy a CDMA card for 20 bucks. She's never traveled outside the Philippines, she's blind. And this was six, 15, 14 years ago. Yeah. How wow. on earth did she? I, 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 I couldn't figure out how could ever do that. How she do that. But but the thing is that learning how the disability manifests itself is very important. Like for example, mm. if I talked about blind people and how fast they are, they are not fast at everything. So if you send a, a blind person a spreadsheet which you have constructed, mm -hmm. it takes them a long time to read that spreadsheet because mm -hmm. they have to go to practically every cell. Yeah. Yeah. To then the cells then the, the software reaches out to them, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, if it's a spreadsheet that they yeah, they know of, they know the structure, then they can quickly zero in on where to put the cursor, yeah. right? So but if they would ask them to build a spreadsheet, they'll build one faster than I can. Mm. Because when the because they can, they decide what to do. This cell will do this. This cell uh, program this. I'll type mm -hmm. this in, and they are faster because they have memorized all the function keys. Mm. So, so, and we never do that. First of all, they type faster than we can. Uh, you know, in the old days when you have what they call touch typists, mm -hmm. you know what ty typists do? They don't need to look at the keyboard to type. They look at the document. And oh yes, type, right. Yes, so, yes, so okay. blind people yeah. can type without looking, yeah. and they are the fastest typists. Yeah. Second thing is that, they, for, for, for example, you want to print the document, right? You click, you know, uh, a document, then a print, then select printer, and then, you know, either three or four clicks for them is something like this, you know, four buttons in one go and then just, they're there already. So they're faster than, than you can be because they have, you know, all the function keys. So it's things like that. It's just a very small example to understand that don't give them a bunch of irregular spreadsheets to to analyze mm -hmm. you know but you want to build, build, build a spreadsheet yeah. i had a blind person build me a spreadsheet with those formulas and then oh. i mean really a, it's like a business plan you know <laughs> you find yeah. where their strengths are and yes you yeah. them yeah. where they are yeah. and exactly. that's that's where it's comes yeah, HR person. it's a normal yeah. thing you, you don't Absolutely. you know everybody has different <laughs> some people don't have no interpersonal skills some people are nerds some people are <laughs> Well, Thomas, I note the time. Mm. Uh, we need to let you go to your next thing. You're mm. very busy on this trip, and uh, we really appreciate you visiting you. our campus. Um, before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your business, your team, uh, and then any final word that you would like to share with us as we wrap up. Okay, so um, my web 
my email address is very simple. I mean, thomas at janeshtim.com and janeshtim is Genevieve, Ashley and Timothy. So it's easy to spell. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not sure what my LinkedIn uh, number is, but you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp number is um, is a Malaysian number. A bit unique why I have a Malaysian number for WhatsApp. It's a 6010-522-5098. So I think for me, um, I spent so many years trying to convince other companies to do that, you know, doing what we do, you can succeed as a company. Um, it's very frustrating that it's not happening. Um, I just wish that, uh, you know, uh, this will help people open up their eyes and you need somebody to help you. You have been so used to remote work during COVID-19, then why not provide the job to somebody in a place, in a situation where it would be very hard for that person to get a job, but he can do the work for you, right? So I think that's the, the and it doesn't matter. You know, the person can be a refugee, can be a disabled person, can be blue, green, white, whatever. Um, you have at your fingertips so much more resources to tap on, yeah. right? So why not, you know, uh, uh, do it for your own benefit? I love it. And we didn't really even get into that, but all the benefits of remote work. Yes that you just highlighted i mean there's so many positive benefits but one of which is just you can literally hire anyone who's capable from anywhere in the world yes. to do the work that needs to be done and that's that's awesome well thomas thank you so much it's been a real pleasure angela thank you thank you john thanks angela we hope everyone stays healthy and safe that you find meaning and purpose at work each and every day and we hope you all have a great week Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.